Hello everybody, and welcome back to Space Engine. Um, this is Mars. I was getting footage from my, oh, the Mars video, so that's why we're here. <laughs> my goodness, I need to make videos more often, although they can be a lot of work. So, yeah, I have two currently in the process. Well, actually, technically three. Um, I have one about nuclear energy, and I'm also working on a like a large kind of full documentary style uh, video about the Venera program because I find them fascinating and Venus is a fun planet. But that video is going to be fairly long and um, a lot of work, so I'm still kind of doing the uh, like the writing for the script currently. But before that, uh, there will be the nuclear energy one coming up and I also have another poem I want to do. So I'll, I'll do that at some point. But I have been very busy this week. Actually, the last few weeks, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I got a bunch of stuff done on, like, my model kits. I have three new kits on my shop for sale. A uh, Flying Saucer, the Chrysler Serve, and Venera 7, which are all very fun. And, yeah. I, I finally got an update done on my game, which I've been meaning to get finished. You can now die in it, but all the deaths are just, like, funny. Ooh, a carbon star. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I tweeted out and posted on Tumblr uh, a screen cap from, like, a test of the game, where one of the things, like you, like, you walk up to this box jellyfish and a prompt comes up and says, press E to pet the box jellyfish. And people thought, people thought, thought that was funny, which it is funny, <laughs> because the box jellyfish, if you don't know, is the most venomous known creature in the ocean like it, it it's you do not want to pet the box jellyfish so that was kind of funny i might do like other things like blue ring octopus and a cone snail like just things you wouldn't want to touch on a beach <clears throat> anyways all of that aside yeah it's just been a very busy couple of weeks and i haven't been able to just sit down and do video stuff because i have a million things going on all the time I'm actually, I'm getting the radio telescope set up finally, because I have pretty much all the parts. Um, I, I, was, I was actually, I was setting up the, let's actually look for planets here. I was setting up uh, the stand that came with the dish, because like, it, it's an adjustable stand. I'm like, okay, I'll just have it aiming straight up, and it, it can't aim straight up. It's always going to be at a bit of an angle, and I was like, that's disappointing. I could cut one of the poles and make it so it can like aim straight up, but I, I don't really want to do that. It's, it just seems like a lot of work. So I'm, what I'm probably going to do is just the dish, and I'm going to have it anchored down on cinder blocks so that it's up off the ground, obviously. But that would also kind of make it easier to anchor down to the ground. Uh, okay, there's two moons with, with life. We have one here. It's unicellular organic subglacial and then right next door is unicellular subglacial i wonder if we can see these moons um from each other so here's this one and it's other oh yeah they're like right next to each other they're very close that makes me feel uh that there is probably a connection between these two uh, these, these organisms like um contamination actually what could have happened here uh let's this is 6.3 6.5 can i look at this uh where's the map because i have an idea all right so we have 6.3 and 6.5. So there's this one's in the way. What could have happened here, if they were a bit closer, this would make more sense, but there could have been a single moon that had life on it, like an ice shell, that broke up, and that breakup then coalesced into two moons. But there's a moon here in between them, so I'm not sure how likely that would be. Or this moon could have, one of them could have broken up and then pieces could have transferred, you know, yada yada, panspermia. You got life on your moons. Interesting. 
but yeah, so the telescope's gonna be on um, cinder blocks because it's just easier. Uh, I I, w- I was kind of hoping the sand the stands would work because like the further off the ground the better, but at the same rate, um, setting them on cinder blocks would be easier because I just haul them out there, set them up, boom, it's done. And plus, be closer to the ground, so it's easier to tie them down. And they're not going to act like sails in case of wind, because that does happen frequently. But, yeah, so I'm having that set up. I'm actually probably going to go out um, in a couple of hours here when the sun starts to come up. I'm going to start assembling the dish itself. Because I have uh, a couple pieces put together, but I need to put the pedal together and then bring them outside and then fully assemble them into the full round dish. And it's actually quite the dish. It's... Uh, two points something meters six feet across and I'm gonna have three of them and there's a plate on my desk causing problems I'll move that to the side I'm gonna have three of them set up in a uh, like a triangle kind of shape wait where's the life ah here we go more life and I have a, uh, a feed horn kind of made for it which I printed off I'm gonna line with aluminum as a test it wouldn't work in the summertime because it's made of PLA and it would distort horribly. But um, when I move it out to the actual observatory, I'm gonna pr- I'm gonna have aluminum feed horns that I'm currently getting um, assessed at a aluminum factory. Let's see if I can make them. There's a lot of impacts on this moon. Uh, this makes me think that this moon's surface does not resurface very well. Which makes me think that the ocean below it does not really come to the surface. And there isn't much in the ways of tectonic activity on this moon. Because like moons like Europa have very few craters because the surface gets renewed and refreshed frequently. I mean, in geological timescales. But then you have moons like Callisto, which is pockmarked with uh, craters because its surface does not get resurfaced very often. That's kind of what it looks like here. Interesting. <sighs> so yeah, that was updates and stuff. <laughs> I was going to make a video yesterday, but I was recovering from a flu shot. It's weird. I usually don't, like, like flu shots don't really bother me that much. But this one this year, it did make me feel kind of crappy for a few hours. So I wasn't able to, like, really work much yesterday. But it's done now. I'm fine. So here we are. And there's a couple topics I was asked to talk about. One of them was my least favorite movie. And that's an interesting question. I'm not actually sure how to answer that. Because I don't really have movies that I hate. There's movies that I don't like. But in terms of ones that I've watched and genuinely hated. I don't. I don't actually know if there are movies that I like. I have to think about this. Uh, there's movies I don't like, obviously. Um, I don't like Marvel movies. I, I find them really boring, personally. But I don't I don't hate them. <laughs> it's like, I, I view the Marvel movies as... They're just... They're made purely for money. Uh, there's not a whole lot of substance to them. They're just... They're just money printers. But people enjoy them which means that they're enjoyable so my opinion doesn't matter it's like they might be money printers but they're enjoyable money printers so who am i to say they're bad and i don't it's like they're not bad i just i don't i don't find them interesting but i wouldn't say they're bad because people like them so they're clearly not bad um in high school in film studies we watched a movie called revolutionary road it was a dicaprio movie I didn't like it. It was basically just watching a family very graphically and horribly fall apart because of internal and external problems. And the it was it was awful. The woman died because of uh, she tried to give herself an abortion and it didn't go well. It was just a very unpleasant movie, and I I didn't like it. Whenever I think of movies I hate, that's the first one that comes to mind. But then again, that was film studies and. Watching movies in school is never generally fun. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know if there's any movies that I actually just genuinely hate. 
Um, uh, it's quite the question. Like again, there's movies I don't like, and there's movies that I I don't watch, and there's a lot of movies I don't watch because I find them boring. Uh, I don't watch slasher horror movies because I find them boring. But I can't say if I like or hate them because I've never watched them. I just know I wouldn't enjoy them. Oop, I saw that. So, that's like that's quite the question. Because it's like assigning hate to something is a strong emotion, and it's like, ooh, exotic unicellular. <clears throat> so it's like, can I actually, like, apply that emotion to something and? Wow. This looks interesting. Is that kind of yellowy colors? I'm unsure. But it's subglacial exotic life. Actually, you know what? Uh, what is the, the hydrosphere on this? Okay, good. It didn't crash the game. Um, physical. Tidal heating. Gravity, metallic core, internal. Uh, there's a water ice envelope, a silicate mantle, carbide mantle, uh, helium hydrogen, albedo. It has no hydrosphere, okay. Um, it could be. If there's hydrogen. Oh. No. But it has a lot of water, and a lot of and a silica, a large silicate mantle. Um, it's abiogenic, subglacial, exotic. What kind of exotic? I want to know what the uh, like what the actual internal structure is made of. Like more, like more information than just this. Like it's water and silicate. I mean, it could be silicon life. Judging by the colors here, I almost wonder if we have some kind of like sulfurous life forms. Kind of like the idea of on um, on Io, there might be exotic life that lives in uh, like the sulfuric, like liquid sulfuric acid uh, pools under the crust, or in, or even in like, uh, oh no, hydrogen sulfide. That's what it was. Like hydrogen sulfide pools under the crust, and you could have life, um, exotic life, maybe living there. So, that's a possibility. Uh, there's a lot of water here, though, so it might be like methanogenic life. It's not carbon based, though. Interesting. Just judging by the, the external structure, there's a lot of uplift and stuff, and complexity and in this outer shell. So whatever the life is that lives underneath it, uh, there's more than just water going on here. Interesting. And actually, speaking of that, uh, the next topic, <laughs> I was trying to think of a movie I hated, and I, I, I honestly can't. This movie that I dislike, but not one I hate. But the next topic I was asked to talk about is alien viruses. And that's an interesting topic. There isn't, like, I mean... There's a lot you could say about them. It depends on what context we're talking about. <laughs> but um, viruses are found everywhere on Earth. There's, like, bacteria and plants and animals. Uh, so viruses may have either evolved alongside other life or uh, separate to it. I don't know if one evolved first or the other, I suspect. Well... If you classify RNA, like replicating RNA, as the first life on Earth, then I can see viruses arising shortly after protocells. Because a virus, uh, it needs a host to reproduce, so I doubt it would evolve first unless they were using other viruses for hosts. Uh, actually, that, that wouldn't work because viruses reproduce by um, injecting their, usually their genetic material, an RNA strand or a plasmid or something into a cell and using the, me uh, the mechanical machinery or the molecular machinery in the cell to make copies of themselves. So essentially it's like uh, breaking into a, like a printing press, 
like mm-hmm. a, a, a newspaper room and stealing their printing press to print your own uh, newspaper as opposed to their newspaper. And if you can do it before you're caught, you can make a lot of your own newspapers before, you know, destroying the machine and running away and then getting those pictures of Spider-Man. Oh, I'm funny. <laughs> Anyways, so that, that's kind of how it works. So um, I would actually assume that viruses would probably evolve a little bit later in the game. Because early protocells, well, they essentially would have just been uh, genetic material encapsulated in a like a fo- like a lipid membrane. They probably actually protocells would have been similar to viruses in structure because they would they would have been simple genetic material around organic uh, around a you know a core of this material. And as they got more complicated, they would have more um, machinery within them to help them do various life functions, like the organelles would have evolved soon after. I guess it depends on how they reproduce. Like, if you have just, like, like lone strands of RNA that free float and are unable to reproduce by themselves until they encounter a protocell, and they can slip their way in and use, like, um, the machinery that is present within the... Like, or that is used to basically separate and copy the DNA. It's like polymerase or something like that? Polymerase? Polymerase? Yeah. <laughs> I know I know what they are. I just forgot the name. It's like polymerase. Where basically, like, it, it, like, un, like one of them unwinds the DNA, and then the other one... Uh, trans like trans like transcript uh, trans- transcripts uh, transcribes it. My goodness, my brain isn't working right now. Preliminaries and transcript rays. So, uh, an alien virus uh, would have to evolve in an environment in which it has a host to reproduce. It's basically what I'm getting at here in this this tangent of non-linear brain breaking, um, and. As such, they would be highly specialized and evolved. I'm not going to do that. Especially evolved to, like, live off those hosts. Uh, what's the atmosphere on this one? Actually, I forgot to check. No, oh, three atmospheres. So it's a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. Interesting. Which I, actually, I covered this in a Mars video I did a while ago, where it's like alien viruses would likely not be a threat to us, because there's no there's no reason for them to be adapted to attacking us. They would probably just die in our bodies. <clears throat> Cuz viruses are very specialized in what they can and can't do. This is why, you know, your cat can have a runny nose because they're sick with something and they sneeze in your face and you're not going to catch it like URV or something like that. And I know this because my cats um, when they were younger had URV and they kept sneezing in my face and it's a feline virus so I can't catch it. Although I still wish they would not sneeze in my face, but yeah, cats will do what what they do, I suppose. Now, how an alien virus would be structured, that depends on, oh, all sorts of things. Like, it could be an RNA virus, it could be a DNA virus. Um, They could operate on something completely different. Like, all you need is basically to inject genetic material into a host and then use their abilities to reproduce. So, the alien virus's genetic coding would be s- compatible with the genetic coding of whatever uh, life exists alongside them. Which does beg the question, could you get exotic forms of viruses? Like, we have carbon-based viruses living here on Earth, attacking our carbon-based life. But if you had, like, silicon-based life, could you have silicon viruses? And... How would that even work? It, to be a virus, it has to like inject some kind of instructions into a host to reproduce. And I have no idea how a silicon-based life would encode genetics and how that would even work. They could encode stuff completely different, and as a result, you couldn't have viruses, maybe. I think maybe like metallic-based life like which is a hypothetical um i don't 
know if they would have viruses in their biosphere just because of how they're how they would be structured or the plasma based life idea of like plasma dust life that might live in like the rings of uranus or neptune um i couldn't see how viruses would evolve in that kind of biosphere because they basically are just like they, they would be living fragments of dust based genetic material so you couldn't really um like you couldn't really usurp a, an encoding mechanism for that to like to happen i haven't really thought about that that's interesting like viruses might just could potentially be a carbon-based only phenomenon like things that use dna and rna might be the only ones that actually have viruses where things that use like maybe like xrna which is a form of dna made in the lab which is stronger than ours um maybe that couldn't use or actually that would probably be able to, to use virus or to be viral in nature but like you know what i mean like non dna encoding uh might be able to like it might result in no viruses in this biosphere but of course this is all speculation i we don't really know we'd have to find it for it to find out one thing we do know is a silicon based life would not be a threat to us really it would just <laughs> the environments we uh, that it lives in versus us would be completely different so like in star trek uh, enterprise that one episode when hoshi and trip got infected with that silicon virus and like were really really sick that that that, that wouldn't happen because the silicon vi virus wouldn't be able to reproduce in our bodies it's like there's very little silicon in our bodies so they wouldn't be able to operate and do anything without just dying oh actually before i go i'm going to look for something uh pegasus all right that's the pegasus galaxy that's the uh Uh, this is the irregular galaxy. All right, not the elliptical. Boop. Yeah. I've been watching Stargate Atlantis, and they're in the Pegasus Galaxy. And they are two Pegasus Galaxies. There's an irregular one, and there's a spherical one. And they never really um, say which one it is. But I suspect it's the irregular one. And there's the Milky Way over there. Because when they when they we, we see it once, like outside the galaxy, uh, we see that it's irregular in shape. So I suspect this is the Pegasus Galaxy from Stargate Atlantis. Anyways, um, I'm going to leave it off there. Although I'm going to check out the other galaxy too because I'm curious. Uh, oh, not that one. It's this one yeah whichever one's three million light years yeah it's not this one for sure it's gonna be the other one so we're gonna go back to the other one Ooh, what's that oh and of course andromeda because these are uh satellites of andromeda anyways uh i'm gonna leave it off there leave it off there uh i'm actually gonna bumble around the andromeda galaxy or the pegasus galaxy um for next time so thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. More videos to come. And if you have ideas for a place for me to go or topics to talk about, let me know in the comments below. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And space.